I'm here with Ian Chalmers. He's the Managing Director for Alcane Resources. How are you today, Ian? Great, thanks, Tracy. Nice to talk to you again. Ian, I want to ask you the question that's on everybody's mind. What is happening with the rare earth market? You are one of the biggest experts in the world. You're in it day to day. You've been in it since, I, I think, the mid-80s, if I recall. Could you... That's true, yeah, yeah mid-80s, yeah. I want to know what you think about the market, the prices, the industry overall. Just what do you think? My view is that we have seen the bottom. I think it's turned around. We're seeing demand start to come back into the market. We're starting to see a bit of enthusiasm in China. I will put a, note, a, quarter, a cautionary note on there, though. It is still an imbalance, and it's going to remain an imbalance for some time into the future where we've got some of the large volume rare earths like lanthanum cerium are potentially going to go into oversupply. The other critical ones like neodymium, praseodymium, I can see remaining in short with high demand. And I can also see things like dysprosium, terbium and yttrium being in very short supply. And I did, I did read and hear uh, Jack's comments the other day. I also listened to Dudley's comments. And I, th I agree with both of them. Uh, the only thing that I probably disagree with, and I think Jack made the comment of coming out of China, that dysprosium might be in balance. Our view is that it won't be in balance. We can see still a strong demand, and to put it in, it'll be still in short supply for a number of years. So, again, we are firmly committed to the industry. We think it's a great industry, uh, but it's still going to go through some choppy times in the next 12 months until everything starts to settle down again. So, Ian... The market may be turning around, at least I'm optimistic about it, and of course I subscribe to the philosophy that renewable energy will be our next industrial revolution, and we have to have rare earths and critical metals to achieve those goals. Now you're a multi-commodity play, and you know some information that I think our audience would enjoy. For instance, you have zirconium, and zirconium is apparently controlled by the Chinese, right? 90% downstream? Correct, that's right, yeah. Yeah, Ch the China's traditionally, for probably the last 15 years or so, controlled the downstream zirconium industry. And uh, yeah, they've, they've kept a really tight grip on it. They've, they've basically controlled all output through, well, throughout the world. And we really we're seeing now a slow change. And it's really come about, it's driven, I have to say this, it's driven by the zircon industry. Zircon's the base, the building block for the downstream industry. And once the zircon price turns and zircon demand turns, then that will slowly flow on into the downstream zirconium industry. And we're seeing that. It started to happen now. So, yes, I think we're, we're on, the, on the up again. Okay. And we have at Alkane Resources, we have rare earths. Okay. We have light and heavies. So, give us an overview on which heavies and which lights you think are going to be most in demand. Okay. Well, let's start with the heavies. Uh, they're, the, they're the interesting ones. I don't think there's any doubt that, in our view, dysprosium, terbium and yttrium are going to be the big drivers for the heavies. But I will throw in there a little bit of, a bit of a snippet that we're, we're feedback we're getting out of a few locations, particularly in Europe, that some of the other ones, like gadolinium, erbium, lutetium, holmium, there are applications which are being developed for those which may impact on the industry in the future. It's too early to say much. but. I still think you know, it's, it's a very interesting stage we're going through. The lights, the lights are going to be driven by neodymium and praseodymium, no doubt about that. And they will be in demand, probably undersupplied, at least for the next five years or so. So still a lot of, lot of development, a lot of interest in those metals. I'm going to put you on the spot, Ian. I'm going to ask you, what's the number one rare earth element that will be in demand in 2014? In 2014, okay. Um, if you ask me the one that has the most significance and value, it is probably neodymium. And the reason for that is because the rare earth magnet industry is still very strong. It's growing. It's going to continue to grow. We're not seeing the same influences that we're seeing, say, for the nickel metal hydride batteries, the replacement by, by lithium iron, which may impact on... on uh, the lanthanides and those sort of things, but I, th I, it's very hard to say one. I do believe also that uh, dysprosium with the magnets as well, terbium and yttrium for phosphors, uh, those are going to also remain in strong demand. So it's hard to really 
pick you up, but I guess if you ask me to, to say that again, probably neodymium is still number one. So alkanes got uh, rare earths, we have zirconium, and you also uh, have niobium. And we we're always talking about the Chinese, but I noticed in your PowerPoint that uh, the Brazil controls 90% of niobium. Is that correct? That's, that's right. I mean, Brazil's traditionally had you know, 90%. They've had it for years and years and years. And the Brazilian company, the Brazilian deposit is so large that they really can dominate the market. What's really interesting with niobium, though, is we're starting to see now China is starting to use a lot more niobium in their steels. Traditionally, they haven't. Probably five years ago, the niobium demand in China was quite small. The Chinese now recognise the, the, uh, the value of having niobium steels, and so they're becoming big buyers. Now, interesting, what we saw last year, last year, 2011, was a Japanese and Korean consortium bought 15% of, of the Brazilian company for, for nearly $2 billion followed very closely by a Chinese consortium by 15% of that Brazilian company for $2 billion. Well, that'll give you a feeling for what's going on in the niobium industry and the, and the strength that we see going forward with niobium, particularly for special steel applications. So alkane's really on top of critical metals. And, and in, in addition to this, I, I noticed you've got tantalum listed, which of course is a critical <laughs> metal. Can you talk to us a little bit about tantalum? Okay, well, four or five years ago, we recognised that we were losing quite a bit of a tantalum in our flow sheet. At that stage, the cost of getting it out didn't justify going after it. So basically, we're very happy with the other metals, the zirconium, the niobium and the rare earths. The tantalum price and tantalum demand has started to escalate to such a point where we've had, we're starting to have another serious look at tantalum. Now, if we could recover half of that tantalum that we lose, we'd add another 40 or $50 million to the revenue to the project and we'd be a significant tantalum producer in the world today. So it's important. It's not going to happen with a development on day one, but it's still very important to us long term. Ian, thank you for the update today. I really appreciate it.